And we're back with Samantha Mowat here on Spaced Out Radio as we had a little bit of a Skype issue there. All of a sudden, Skype crashed. So if you're listening in, you do want to refresh your computers because you're not going to be able to hear this if you're not refreshing. You know, because that's just the way it is. So we're going to wait for everybody to get back in here, Samantha, uh, Mm -hmm. as we just fired things up. You know, you got to hate technical difficulties. And sometimes they just rattle you, man. They rattle you. (laughs) I tell you. Yeah, they do. At least you don't have any thunderstorms or lightning storms right now. No, no. It's actually been nice up here. It's actually been really nice. And uh, I have to say this. Joe made a comment in the Spaced Out Radio chat room uh, on Facebook here. He say, Midnight Confession. Samantha is the only redhead that doesn't scare me. Yay! Well, that's one. Good job, Joe. Uh-huh. Absolutely. And, you know, when Joe speaketh, you know, there he is. <laughs> He's just going away, and he's flying. And I want to thank everybody for their patience there. It's one of those things that just kind of happens sometimes in the land of computers. And you know what? As an old hack radio guy where I actually had people producing and actually using equipment made for radio, you have no idea how frustrating this is for me at times when things like this happen. It is totally frustrating. Frustrating to all beat hell, but what do you do? What do you do? That's all I got to say. Go play hockey. (laughs) Exactly. We got to play more hockey in this world. Got to play more hockey. You know, so one thing that you got to do is if you're listening in and you're wondering how to get this show back online, just refresh your computer. We are back up and running, talking with Samantha Mowat here on Spaced Out Radio If you are a space traveler, Bill Cardwell set the password at concurrence tonight if you missed it. Concurrence is your password, and a few people have got the show. So, in my mild heart attack, as people file back in here, what were you talking about right before the break? Oh, my God. Let me think. Um, We were talking about the different reasons for contact. That's right. When it comes to children. Thank you. Yeah. And at what point, and I got to ask you this, because we were talking about kids and their dreams and how to believe them and everything like that. And one of the comments that you made, Samantha, was about um, flying. And I have Mm -hmm. to tell you, some of my most vivid dreams when I was around three years old Mm -hmm. I used to remember because my parents always told me about the boogeyman as I think most parents do in order to get their kids to go to bed you know and I remember as a kid always dreaming about the boogeyman but I always remember that I could fly you know Mm -hmm. much like a bird all I would do is flap my arms and at three years old but the boogeyman would always try and jump up to get me And he never really got me. The odd time he would grab onto my leg, but I was always able to wiggle out and and keep on flying. And then he would chase my friends in my dreams. Is this kind of what you were talking about in regards to that? Yes, in one extent I was, although I was not making reference to a boogeyman. But really, it could be crossed over because if you think about it, when you're astral projecting, you have conscious control over your actions and where you are in any given scenario. So you can do things like fly or teleport or um, walk through walls, things of that nature. And that is something I'd like for all of you to encourage your children to start doing when they're dreaming is, hey, if you realize, um, little Sally, that you're dreaming, then, okay, go ahead, learn how to fly. Practice flying when you're dreaming. (coughs) Pardon me. Or... um, Why don't you try jumping onto the top of a building or something like that? Because when you teach your children how to be empowered in their dreams, if they're having encounters with multidimensional beings, they can apply these same tactics as evasive techniques that they need to remove themselves from a situation. And for those of you who do have children and you suspect they are having encounters, I do suggest writing down 
what your children are telling you about this because the more you are able to see what all is happening to them, the clearer of an idea you will have as to how to react and how to proceed. Like let's say every two or three months your child is saying, you know, mommy, I keep having scary dreams about grasshoppers or dinosaurs or about zombies or whatever. You do need to have an idea of what they're seeing when they're astral projecting. Because if they are seeing things like zombies, they may be um, going to a different dimension where that is a possibility. Or let's say they're encountering mantis beings. Well, they may be seeing them and recalling them as grasshoppers or things of that nature. So, yeah. Well, you know what? I think it's very interesting and I think it's a good lesson as we were talking about right before our Skype went poof that Mm -hmm. parents... If you have contact or you believe in the paranormal or something along those lines, it's always good to keep an open mind and keep that open line of questioning with your child because, you know, not to go all psychological here or anything, but if you believe your child, your child's more likely to talk to you about anything because they will know that they can talk about anything to you. So it actually works out better for absolutely everyone. Oh, I agree completely. And one thing, Dave, that you had mentioned is what are the reasons why a child may be taken by extraterrestrial beings, um, let's say, out of their home and onto craft or two different worlds? And another thing that I've found with my encounters is sometimes when you're taken onto craft, in particular when you're being introduced to new beings, sometimes you're just brought up there so that other beings can learn how to interact with Earth humans. Like I had this one encounter, and I think this was my only encounter I really had with black-eyed children. And anyways, I found myself on craft one time, and it looked very different because the inside was bright, but it was designed or furnished differently than a home. And I was looking around going, okay, this is different. This doesn't look like a normal building. And as I was walking by, I noticed that I was being observed by these two children. And I looked at their eyes, and they were so very, very black. Yet these children were quite pale, and the children sat very close together. There was a boy on the right, and a girl, I believe she was on the left. Nope, vice versa. My guides are saying inverse. They just told me to switch that. The boy was on the right. The girl was on the left. Thank you, guides. But um, anyways, these children weren't used to being near humans that were more consciously aware of their situation. And the reason I had been brought up into the craft on that experience was so these beings could learn how to better interact near humans. And I remember I wasn't being mean to them, but I looked at them and I was looking at them very carefully when I told them, you're doing a terrible job at pretending to be human. Your eyes were all wrong. You're not blinking. Humans blink. You need to blink. I remember them looking at me like, okay, what are, you, what are you talking about? Okay, trying to blink, and they were blinking with eyes being uneven and things like that. But one thing that a lot of kids have talked to me about is when they do go up on craft or they find themselves on other worlds, they're interacting with other kids that seem like they're a little bit different than them. And these are kids that are living living on different dimensions, some growing up on craft, some growing up on different um, worlds, And really, that's part of what they're doing is they're trying to get our children and us accustomed to interacting with these beings so that when our worlds do finally come together, when disclosure does finally happen, not as many of us are inclined to panic and fall for some of the more negative agendas that are out there. They want us to be able to perceive and perceive the energy that's going around us. Okay, is this a real um, extraterrestrial multidimensional being or is this something that is a facade? They want us to be able to tell the energetic difference. Let's get to some questions from the audience here and change topics as we only got about 25 Mm -hmm. minutes left. Of course. Let's get to, where is it here, Michael's question in the SOR Space Travelers. He is asking, Samantha, are your experiences more astral than real-time and face-to-face? Typically, yes, because I get really annoyed when they interrupt my life. I know that may sound a bit odd, but if I'm, let's say, if it's summer vacation and I don't have activities to bring my family to and I've booked time off, then no problem. I'm happy to have encounters. But if I'm trying to go between school and activities and work and everything else, 
I do get very annoyed when they are interrupting my life. If I walk into my garage to go get something out of the freezer and I find that five or ten minutes have elapsed and I can't account for it, I get very annoyed at beings and I have no problem being like, stop it. I don't like it when you do that. And you know I don't like it when you do that. So, yes, a lot more of mine have switched over to astral in the last two years. Claudia is asking, have you ever felt like you can dematerialize or have you ever with a thought said, I'm invisible and poof. There you were, gone about? No, Claudia, and I also haven't tried it, but I did have an encounter with one being who was sitting in my car, and he was telling me that we are able to change the vibration of our body to being invisible in one dimension, yet being physical in the other, purely by changing the energy as it interacts in our troidal flow. But that's something completely different. Trip in the Spaced Out Radio chat room on Spreaker is asking... Do you mm-hmm. believe that Faraday cages can help prevent them from being abducted or children from being abducted, like blocking off portals? I believe it's very possible. I've always wanted to build a Faraday cage to see how they would interact and what things can and can't go through them. Um, trip, when I do end up building a Faraday cage in the next two or three years, like I'm intending, I will definitely let Dave know so he can tell you. Oh, hell with it. You'll still be on the show. You can tell him yourself. Perfect. Exactly. How would you sleep in a Faraday cage? Because all the ones I've seen, everybody's standing in them. Well, he's had to get a lot of copper and make it really big. No kidding. No kidding. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get back to a Claudia question here. She is asking, Samantha, I had a dream. I was in a room with my daughter, and an ET came into the room and said they were going to take my daughter, that she needed a healing In the dream, she was five years old, but in real life, she was 20. And in the dream, I knew she was 20, not five. So they took her in another room, and as I was sitting there, there were about eight people in a room. I looked Mm -hmm. at them and said, I am from the future, but had to come back for this, and I just wanted to share this with you. So if it happens to you, you won't be scared. My question is, Mm -hmm. since I knew her real age, her daughter's, in the dream, Do you think that this was a real encounter or just a weird dream? I would say that's a real encounter because they are able to modify time and go between one point in time and another, Claudia. They could have taken your astral body, so your soul, out of your body when this dream had occurred to you and taken you back in time to when your daughter was five as a means of comforting your daughter. So you would have the remembrance of your daughter being five, although you could be seeing her at herself when she was five. Or remembrance of your daughter at 20 when she was five. Please, I hope you understood what I just said. I get exactly what you're saying. I know when my daughter started driving a year ago, I picked her up the day she got her learner's license. And I went Mm -hmm. went around the vehicle and I sat in the passenger seat, put my seatbelt on. I looked over to my left. And I swore she was the three-year-old girl in her summer dress with her white sandals on, standing on the driver's seat, holding onto the steering wheel, the big smile on her face like, hey, daddy, I'm driving. (laughs) You know, it's one of those things with with parents we always try and, you know, look back (laughs) on with fond times. Could it be a little bit of that as well? It could be in one sense, yes, but in my experience, Dave, they are very good at the manipulation of time and jumping from one point in time forwards and backwards. So I wouldn't be surprised if they were taking her backwards in time and then returning her to the present day as well. Joe has a question in the SOR Space Travelers, and he is asking, do green and hazel-eyed people get abducted more than others? Mm, that would depend upon what their DNA is made of. Typically, green or hazel eye people will have the rhesus negative gene in them. And a lot of my family has green or hazel eyes. So in my experience, yes, I would say so. Are there different cultures or different people in this world that tend to get taken more than others? Mm, That I can't necessarily speak of because I am talking to one man in India who's having experiences and I do know a lot of natives that are having experiences as well as, 
Well, I've also had people of African American descent and people that are Caucasian mention it, but as of yet, I haven't had anyone who is. Well, nope, that's not true. They're correct to me. I only know of one Asian gentleman who's had experiences. So it does seem like they're connect- collecting people from every race. But being where I live in Canada, typically I interact most with Caucasians or Aboriginals. I don't have the ability at this time to find out from as many people of other ethnicities as to whether they are having contact or not. I only know of a handful. Sorry. Carl has sent me a message on Twitter asking, Samantha, how do you tell the difference between a love bite and a crush? I am an ET contactee. I think I am having a love bite session, but I'm not sure if it's because I secretly crush on a woman who is currently taken or if it's an actual love bite. Could you help me? I will certainly try my best, Carl. So, Carl, one thing I noticed when I was starting to have a love bite situation unfold was when I initially met the man that I had my love bite with, I recognized him. I did not know how I recognized him, but I knew that I did. But I did not have any feelings of um, crush towards him for the first six months or any feelings of sexual energy exchange, like your kundalini rising or anything like that. And... For me, I noticed that I started to have a lot of um, astral encounters with him where I would see him on craft or I would suddenly run into him on the other side in the weirdest of situations. And whenever I'd run into him, we were always completely alone. There was no one else near us, but you could sense other energies being present or observing, yet not visible. So for me, really, that should have been a red flag, but at the time, I didn't think too much of it. Um. Carl, one thing I noticed was I started to actually pay attention to, okay, how am I feeling about this person when I'm awake, when I haven't seen them for a while? And are, is it becoming almost like an obsession? Because with a lot of love bites, there tends to be an obsessive quality to it that doesn't feel like it's organically your own. It'll feel like, okay, why do I like this person so much? I don't understand it. They're not my usual type. They're not... Um, you won't necessarily be able to justify or explain it, yet you'll feel compelled to want to talk to them and be near them despite it not necessarily making sense for you to have them in your life or for your life to up and change so that they could be included in your life. One thing that you can also look for with this is if you're having any dreams do you ever notice ETs with you or are you noticing that your dreams are suddenly going more sexual and incorporating this person? For me, that was something I had never had outside of that one person. I, I'm sorry to be too graphic or blunt, but I did not have sexual dreams outside of this person ever, not before them, not after them. It was only orchestrated near them. And I always notice odd energy being present. So for me, that was a good indication that there were multidimensional beings being present and observing it and orchestrating it and pushing for this to move forward. Then I started to have ETs pushing me to be in a relationship with this person by hacking into my dream state and visiting me saying, we want you with this person, we want you with this person, which was annoying. Oh, and sorry, one more thing. Um, If it's just a crush, you will not notice a overwhelming amount of synchronicity. But if it's a love bite, you will be overwhelmed with that person's name, that person's vehicle type. If they're in a relationship, you will notice their spouse's name a lot. You will notice all sorts of ridiculous things like that occurring. It will be like a synchronicity overload. Yes, Dave, please continue. I just find that topic totally, totally interesting because... I never knew that, like, I knew from reading in my research before this show and even talking to people on this show that Mm -hmm. there is a divine interest in sexuality when it comes to extraterrestrials and human sexuality, but to Mm -hmm. actually force a, could you call it forcing a sexual relationship? (laughs) Hyper-encouraged. Or or, or hyper-encouraged, or however you want to put it, to say, Mm -hmm. we want to see that person have a sexual relationship with that person. And have a baby. <laughs> Quite often. P- possibly. You know, is it normally in a relationship type love bite or is it more like a one night stand type love bite? 
it is could there be a difference? Either, um, not to the best of my knowledge, unless they're hoping to bring two people together multiple times to gain more information about them. You got to remember, a lot of people, when they're having a love bite scenario, one of them or both of them will be in relationships. And sometimes they're creating this situation to see, okay, exactly how do humans that are, um, let's say, for instance, psychic or not psychic or of all different categories coming together and how are they interacting when they have these experiences going through. I think it's almost like scientists observing, I hate to put us as rodents, but rodents and how they um, interact with different pheromones and external sources to stimulate or encourage them to do certain actions. I do think it's more of a scientific focus for them in most cases or an energetic feeding purpose, depending upon the beings. Claudia has a question here. Of course she does. She always has good questions. Claudia is asking, have you ever sat down and had a conversation with extraterrestrials and had them explain their view or belief in God and what God may be? From what they've explained to me, I have sat down with them and God has come up briefly. Although the only things they've said to me, because I had asked one time about my Jesus encounter, and they said, no, that was a facade. That was definitely not the one, which is what they had called it to me. And the one being that I had talked to said that it was more of a energetic focus, well, more of a creative force, not focus, thank you, and that at this time it was presenting itself more feminine. But from what I understand from other beings, and I've tried to talk to them about it, is it goes in waves where it's presenting male and that's presenting female and that it goes in shifts, almost like it's constantly evolving and changing and swirling. They haven't ever said that we've got it right. I've had a couple beings say that we don't understand about what it is we're believing in, like humans do not understand what we're focusing on. And I have had one being, well, I grew up when I grew up, I hate to put it this way, but my family's Catholic. So I had thought for the longest time, okay, well, maybe this is right. And then when I had my encounter at 16, I suddenly knew that all the ways in which my family were perceiving the form of creating for, creative force was inaccurate. And all of a sudden, after that encounter, I'm, I did for a long time really hate all religions. I've totally changed that perception now where I can appreciate people having spirituality. But the way in which that encounter changed me was they had explained something to me that we've got it wrong and you can't focus on it in the way you're viewing it. So I don't know how to better explain that. One final question here from Claudia. She is asking, in your contact with extraterrestrials, what do they like about humans? Besides maybe maybe a main course or a side dish or an appetizer. (laughs) A lot of them don't eat us. Most of us find us to be utterly fascinating from what they've explained to me. They look at us as being so diverse in the way in which we react in our situations and the amount of energy we have in our emotions and how we take everything. Even one thing they kind of showed me, and it was kind of a funny analogy, was my little brown guy had showed me one time, me to my youngest child and saying, do you see how controlled you are in your circumstances? And how that child seems like their energy is overwhelming their every thought and how their actions are entirely dictated in the moment and not far beyond that. I'm like, okay, I understand that. They're like, that's how we are to you. You are out of control and yet we are more controlled. And it looked at me like it's entertaining to watch you. It's interesting to watch you because you're able to... All the energy that is contained within our emotions actually gives us great power and great capability but we're not really focusing and harnessing it in such a way that we're productive. We're actually, he kind of described it as being turbulent, almost like a windstorm, blowing in and then blowing out. It was quite interesting. Um, he was speaking to me mostly through images, so it's kind of hard to explain that. But a lot of the information they explain is in blocks of information rather than sentences. I'm not quite sure how to better explain it rather than an entire thought concept. Yes, Dave. What about uh, getting back to the religious side for a second? Because I was just thinking while you were answering that question that Mm -hmm. ETs have told you that 
we don't really have a real perception of what God is all about. I remember in Philip Kraft's book, he when he was in contact with the Verdants, he yes. had stated to the Verdants that, you know, ask them about God and is God real and is heaven real? Mm-hmm. And the lady Verdant that he reportedly talked to in this book got all excited, says, yes, we have found heaven. It does exist. God does exist. And when they found heaven up in the sky, which mm-hmm. apparently is a place, cool. you know, just turn left at Albuquerque. You know, you, you base, what they basically said was that they went and got their pope or their highest priest or their highest spiritual leader, and the mm-hmm. spiritual leader went in through the door, I guess, or the gates or whatever you want to put it, and a few days later came back and said, rejoice, he is real, and pretty much left it at that. So when you have a species like the Verdant saying that heaven and God are real, mm-hmm. and then you have your experiences saying that we cannot perceive what heaven and God are like, do you see a correlation there, or do you see a humanization of what the Verdants were trying to say to Philip Kraft? Mm, what I see around that is if you look at the different types of species, and they're all coming at it from their own cultural or species awareness, their own evolutionary awareness. What he was saying to me is that we as humans cannot fully perceive it because we're coming at it from a very limited and fixed perspective, so we're not able to clearly see how it is they have encountered this God being or how it is they've encountered that energy, that creative force. Because if you think about most of the religions of the world, they tell us what it wears and what it does and what rules it has rather than looking at God as more of a creative force using the ultimate expression of, okay, if I do this, what happens? Okay, now let's try that and see how this goes about in that way. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Eric is asking in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker, how much of our religion's beliefs are holding us back when it comes to extraterrestrials? Immensely. Our religions teach us to avoid our psychic abilities, to shut down and to look without, to find answers rather than to look within. And most beings that are benevolent will teach you to look within, to find love, to find that connection to all And through that will come communication with them and knowing not only the God source consciousness, but seeing our connection to each other. And our religions can't do the opposite. They divide and conquer us completely. And that's part of what's holding us back. And that's why they don't agree with how our religions are taking away our own personal power, or at least that's how they've explained it to me. Mario is asking, Samantha, do you have pets? And do they help you with alien presence awareness? Yes, and I actually have a whole wackadoodle of fish and a dog. And she's great um, in a lot of ways. Like, I'm often out in the woods with my dog, and I've been shooting a bunch of YouTube videos I need to go on to YouTube and upload, but I've been horribly busy. And I'll be walking in the woods with her, and all of a sudden, I'll feel something. And if I notice her ears are perking up and look in the same direction that I'm feeling something, then I know, okay, there is actually something here. She and I were shooting one video, um, I think it was in early June, and... Right as I'm trying to get my camera going, I noticed, okay, well, I'm feeling something, but I don't see something. And my dog's running around me, like maybe 10 or 15 feet away from me. And she's going in all sorts of directions. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this white blur of some kind of being running around. And I'm like, what the heck is that? And then I look, I'm like, okay, well, it looks bipedal. It looks like it's some form of white being, okay. And then my camera battery kept going and dying on me. And I'm like, why are you dying? You were full when I left the house. So something was playing with it. And another time when I was on the island this summer, I was at a place called Seal Bay. And I've got my dog, and she's on her leash, and she's laying down about 10 feet away from my camera. I'm standing in front of the camera just doing a video and I notice her ears perk up and her head's moving facing one like down then up then over then over and she's looking a bunch of different directions. I'm like, okay, what are you seeing? And of course I'm distracted speaking to the camera 
And the next thing I know, my camera, which was screwed into my tripod, decided it was going to fall off my tripod. When nothing was touching it, I was nowhere near it. There was no wind. And I'm like, oh, you were seeing the being that was playing near my camera that knocked it over. So, yes, dogs definitely perceive it. They s- and cats do, too. But they see things more interdimensionally than we do because they don't have the same belief system holding them back saying they can't. To them, it just is. And I love that about animals. How do you tell the difference between... Mm -hmm. an extraterrestrial presence and a paranormal presence in the sake of your camera? Well, in the sake of my camera, you can feel the energetic difference. Typically, paranormal things will be things such as ghosts or um, lower astral beings, things like that. So typically, when you encounter ghosts, um, they have a very human, earthly energy. They will feel like they're... uh, Typically, either sad or determined or one heavy set of motion. If they're more of, let's say, a paranormal energy where it's just some sort of wandering spirit around, you can feel the vibrational difference. You know how when you've got a ghost nearby, it feels kind of spooky or a little bit eerie? Yes. Like yes, not I a do. deceased person, it feels different than a ghost. It's, it's like that with a lot of paranormal energies. It feels slightly mischievous versus an extraterrestrial multidimensional energy. It feels like it's more methodical, typically more calculated, like it's more aware and has um, more consciousness as to what its actions are doing. And as though it's in full control of the situation versus a ghost feels like it's just wandering around, like it's still going about its day to day life, but not exactly knowing it, if it can have an impact on what it is it's going to do. But an ET that feels like it's annoyed at you and not wanting you to make a video can knock over your camera by very easily changing things. Yes. we got about two and a half minutes. I want to try and squeeze in two questions of here. Course. This one from Joe. Yep. You said most of them don't eat us. Which ones yes. do? Um, some of the reptilians do eat us. Some of the grave varieties feed off our energy. Although I have noticed quite a few fetuses do get taken from people and sometimes i wonder if there's a component to that that they use as a food source or as a sustainer although i'm not certain about that part i do know there are varieties of reptilians such as brown ones and green ones that do eat us sorry for bringing that part Stay up. away from them stay away from them maybe that's why van halen doesn't allow the brown m&ms maybe they're actually reptilian and quickly from claudia here as we fired up bumblefoot for the night Seems the ETs would find it hard using our little eyeballs to see through when they come in from another dimension and enter here on Earth. Do they? Do their eyes have to adjust? I think they do, and depending upon certain ETs, yes, they can be from darker worlds, or they can be more of a night vision animal or something along... I hate to use the word animal, but we are all animals. Depending upon how bright it is on their home planet, coming to ours can be difficult, and that's why a lot of ETs, you will find them out if they're walking about outside at night, or they may have eye coverings. That's why you'll see some varieties of grey, their eyes are not actually in that large almond shape, some of them do have more of the round eyes as we have, and for them it can be more of a glasses type thing that's on their face. So yes, it is very bright here, and no, they can't all handle it. Well, I apologize for the technical difficulties tonight, Sam, but another great broadcast has come to an end with you, my dear. It's good to have you along for this ride, and you will be back on the show Mm -hmm. from Scotland. I know. I'm so excited. On October 11th. Mm -hmm. I'm excited. I haven't had anybody on the air from Scotland. Maybe you'll get an accent before then. I will try my best in the three days I'm there before we do that. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. Make sure you strive hard for that because we're going to need that accent. I hope you have a wonderful time, you and your family. That's just fantastic. And, you know, hopefully we'll get to see you personally before that. I'm going to get you to hold on here because I'm going to start wrapping this things up. Once again, sorry about the technical issues tonight. What a good time for Skype to decide, hey, I need an update. It happens, it (laughs) sucks, but what are we going to do? Can't do anything about it. Tomorrow night on the show, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time, the crypto guru Ronald Murphy is back, and he's bringing the crypto kid with him. We're going to learn all about that as we talk giants and more tomorrow night 
on Spaced Out Radio. It's going to be a good one. Remember, you can listen to us on TuneIn, listen to us on iTunes. Everything you need to know about Spaced Out Radio is at spacedoutradio.com. I will be back in the hot seat in approximately 21 hours and, I don't know, 20 seconds from now. Yeah, what the heck. We'll add in that 20 seconds, maybe 21. You have a good one. It's always a pleasure to have you with us on the mighty S-O-R. Remember, follow us on Twitter as well, at Spaced Out Radio. If you're on Facebook, stop by. Say hello. Talk to you later. (laughs) 